Good evening, everyone. Glad to have you join me tonight. We'll get started in just a few moments. See a few of you on here already. series of discussions over the next so many weeks uh, except for the first week of December which is the family faith night but uh, over these weeks we'll be covering the last things um, of the church and good evening Paulette good to see you see Pam watching <clears throat> we'll uh, yeah I think these are some important discussions to have uh, especially at the end of the um, liturgical year we always have readings that are pointing to final judgment uh, the end of times and as we enter into Advent we kind of have that same theme in the first couple of weeks anyway and so it's good to know what the church teaches uh, on that Hi, Monty and Lorraine. Hoping uh, everybody's doing well tonight. <clears throat> Hi, Mom and Dad. Hi, Diana. <clears throat> Notice that sometimes we don't like to talk about these uh, subjects, but I think they're very important. Um, and especially tonight, we will focus on the first of the last things, uh, which is uh, death. And, you know, I want to start with... Uh, a prayer obviously and also to ask for some prayer intentions that I've received that we could all maybe pray for um, uh, was asked for prayer for uh, a couple of people who have the COVID virus and um, and uh, are not doing well so we want to keep them in prayer and we'll pray for Denise and Earl tonight and uh, many in the past few days that uh, that I know have passed uh, have died and so we want to pray for the repose of their soul and we'll pray for all of those who are suffering from the virus and uh, all of those who are um, who have died from it that the Lord may have prepared them for that moment and we'll ask for that tonight we'll learn more about that tonight as well uh, and I think I saw uh, Pam and Diane and Wes welcome everybody and so let's uh, remember those um, that we want to tonight and bring them to our mind and our heart and we'll bring those to prayer uh, to begin with in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit Amen. Good and gracious Father, we praise and thank you for your many gifts, the gift of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, who has conquered sin and death. May we enter more into his life. Uh, may we trust ever more deeply in your love and your providential care. May we, you open our minds and our hearts tonight to learn those truths of the faith that will help us ever more to uh, direct and dedicate our life uh, to you. May you uh, protect our time together and always uh, draw us ever closer to your most sacred heart. 
For we ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right. So we'll get started. Uh, and traditionally speaking, the last things uh, were known as the four last things. Death, judgment, heaven, hell. Uh, but uh, the, just kind of following the basis of the catechism, there are a few other things in there. And so we're going to take a look at the some of the other ones. Death, judgment, heaven, purgatory, hell, resurrection, and new creation. Because uh, the scriptures teach us about the new creation. And I'm going to stick very closely to the uh, revelation of the church, the revelation by God uh, to the church and its continual uh, kind of teaching on it throughout the, the centuries. And so we'll follow, if you got your Bible and your catechism, uh, there's a link that you can go to on our website that has a, an outline for tonight and it has many of those references to the catechism and the scriptures that we will be looking at tonight and that way we're just uh, we're not going to base this on the private revelation uh, or any of that you can look at some of those on uh, but they always need to match up with the teaching of the church um, because indeed they are private revelation uh, there's oftentimes too one of the reasons I wanted to talk about this is uh, there's been a lot of talk around uh, the end times and these type of things out there and I think it can be a danger to get bogged down into the private revelations and what they've said and uh, all of these things uh, but to really just understand what the church teaches and then to live our life faithfully with Christ that's that's what we're supposed to do uh, as we'll find out Later on, you know, Jesus said no one knows the time or the hour. That goes for our own death as well as for the end of time completely. Uh, and so we'll dig through some of this stuff and hopefully get a better foundation on it. Uh, a couple of things to begin with, uh, really the, the ultimate questions of life um, that kind of shape a person's worldview and our understanding of death motivate and determine how we live right so it's a very important question to understand what we believe about death uh, what we believe about uh, or what our worldview is because that's going to determine how we live our life and I think that's once it's stated it's very obvious that uh, what you believe about the afterlife is going to determine and direct how you live your life uh, so the the, the kind of the five ultimate questions that uh, someone would ask uh, and depending on how they answer it is kind of their worldview are uh, very determinant of how we live or who are we uh, where do we come from what is the problem what is the solution uh, and where are we going what is the ultimate destiny of the world and so of those five we're going to focus on the final one of course where are we going what's the ultimate desti destiny of the world and as a matter of fact that one will have an effect on all of the other uh, questions uh, and so this kind of study of the end times of the end of the world of death and judgment and heaven hell purgatory those things are, are studied under the uh, the part of theology called eschatology which is just uh, comes from the Greek word that means eschaton which means the end right um, and so we want to talk about personal eschatology that our personal end the end of life and then the general eschatology or the study of the end time and end of history uh, and so we're gonna dig in right off the bat with with death Right, that's our, our first one. Now, Pope Benedict uh, kind of made this observation about the about death in modern times, uh, and how it's kind of uh, self contradictory, many times, uh, because in one way, we hide it away. Right, we have modern medicine and 
and things it's unseemly it kind of must be hidden uh, we don't really like it's kind of taboo we don't really like to talk about it or even deal with it uh, which is very new uh, in the industrial times right so we n used to uh, a while ago now but not that long ago when you look at the history of the world uh, <clears throat> one would you know die in the home with family and they would be uh, waked and then taken out and uh, buried nearby usually in the church's uh, graveyard uh, or even in a family one close to the to the house so it was very very much a real part of life and now it's kind of moved uh, out of our life and so it's kind of something we don't like to talk about we don't like to think about I mean it makes sense uh, in certain certain sense that we don't like to talk about it but it is a reality now on the other hand Pope Benedict uh, said that you know uh, modern television glorifies death I mean you're hard-pressed to get to 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 change the channel five times and not find some form of death happening you know the shoot, shooting or violence uh, in movies and things there's death uh, so in two in two opposite ways uh, there's still this fascination with it uh, and ultimately that's that's the thing I mean all basically all modern literature you know the the great writings they focus on some kind of death at the end of the, the book and uh, there's still this fashion fascination with it so it's good for us to understand it correctly what is the biblical vision of death and what is uh, the Catholic vision of death which is you know the same uh, what does it mean so what is death so let's take a couple of look at a couple different ways of understanding it than the biblical way that are out there uh, as we as a society and a world uh, in many parts of it get further away from uh, any type of faith in God uh, more and more these are the ways that people think even if they wouldn't be able to put words to it necessarily but many people think this way one of these ways uh, the first one would be that at death it's just the end people cease to exist you go into nothingness right <laughs> whatever that means uh, and so there's no hope after death so they live as if nothing is going to happen at that point and that would be what the Sadducees in the Bible believed they didn't believe in life after death uh, and Jesus calls them out for that and then uh, it's also in the modern times known as nihilism right nothingness all right it's this um, kind of void of any reality after death so those are still around from the time of Jesus until now uh, and then there was another understanding of like what we would call passing away and we sometimes use this kind of language uh, so the spirit or soul departs from the body uh, but to where they weren't really sure and this is something that the Greek the Greeks held right so they believed in the immortality of the soul which is good because it is immor immortal uh, but they didn't know what was after so they had no idea they just it went somewhere but they weren't really sure where uh, and many times we'll say kind of use that kind of phrasing of passing away instead of um, someone died or uh, you know and I don't think that's wrong but it had a more of a technical understanding in the Greek language of like uh, just the soul continues on and there's a transition where it passes into another realm and in the modern world this idea is a little bit hazy as to where it goes but the the Greeks believe this from long ago as some type of disembodied spirit and then the third one that's kind of common in our world today is what we know as reincarnation it used to be called transmigration uh, where the soul leaves one body and takes up another one and this you'll find in Hinduism and Hollywood uh, a lot um, 
so you, you pass into uh, into another body, into another, maybe you're born again as some other person or uh, go into some animal or I don't know. There's all kinds of things. Hinduism and Hollywood. Uh, of course, we don't, those don't sum up our beliefs of uh, what happens at death. And so we want to look at the biblical definition of death. Uh, because that's important for us to know what the Bible teaches, what God has revealed to us about death. Um, and let me... Um, all right, so let's uh, kind of dig in. And so if you got your catechism handy, we're going to look at... Um, Paragraph 105. So in the catechism, we go by the paragraphs. In the big green version, uh, it's uh, on page 262. But uh, here's what the catechism says for us. <clears throat> it says, To rise with Christ, we must die with Christ. We must be away from the body and at home with the Lord, which is from 2 Corinthians. In that departure which is death, the soul is separated from the body. It will be reunited with the body on the day of the resurrection of the dead. All right. It is in regard to death that man's condition is, almost, is most shrouded in doubt. In a sense, bodily death is natural, but for faith, it is in fact the wages of sin. For those who die in Christ's grace, it is a participation in the death of the Lord so that they can also share in his resurrection. Uh, all right, so we've got the end of earthly life. We've got the separation of the soul and the body. That's uh, what death is. And then there's this, uh, it's, it's definitely a mystery, right? Because none of us talking about it have experienced it. And so there's still a bit of a mystery to it. But we know that it wasn't uh, natural. It wasn't what was supposed to happen uh, and so we see that uh, it's a consequence of sin in paragraph 108 the church's magisterium as inter uh, authentic interpreter of the affirmations of scripture and tradition teaches that death entered the world on account of man's sin uh, and we'll get to that uh, in just a minute uh, but want to note one thing and Paragraph 1013, uh, it says, Death is the end of man's earthly pilgrimage of the time of grace and mercy which God offers him, so to work out his earthly life in keeping with the divine plan and to decide his ultimate destiny. When the single course of our earthly life is completed, we shall not return to other earthly lives. It is appointed for men to die once. There is no reincarnation after death. So that takes care of the one... Uh, the last one of that reincarnation. There is not any reincarnation uh, after death. You get one life, all right, and your immortal soul continues on and will be reunited with your body at the end of time. Uh, so what is the, the soul, right? So if we're going to understand death, we need to, and the separation of body and soul, we need to understand kind of a little bit of what the soul is. And so we want to look at the catechism, just get a kind of a brief understanding at least of what the soul is. And we want to go to paragraph 362. By the way, uh, if you don't have the catechism yet and a good Catholic Bible, those are two of your most important things. That's what teaches us uh, the revelation of God, what he has revealed to us. So you're, gonna, you're always going to find uh, the catechism is fantastic. I've read it three times and I use it all the time when I'm going to teach something, when I want to know what, what the church teaches. It's a compendium of all the teachings of the church throughout the history. Uh, and it's dense. Uh, it's sometimes difficult, but it's definitely something to pray with and to study uh, because it's very, very powerful. All right, so uh, in paragraph 362, the title right above it is body and soul but truly one so this is important the human person 
created in the image of God is a being at once bodily and spiritual. Right? So the biblical account expresses it in symbolic language when it affirms that then the Lord God formed man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living being. Man whole and entire is therefore willed by God. So uh, to be precisely human is to be body and soul. That's why after our death and the incorruptibility of our soul, our soul lives on and it goes to our judgment and we'll see that later, uh, that that's, that's the, um, it's not what a human person was made for. And so that's why we believe by the fact that Jesus rose from the dead bodily in his glorified body, that we too will be brought back together fully human uh, with our glorified body at the end of time, which we'll also get to all of that. But it's important to remember, right? Because sometimes um, we have some uh, iffy ideas out there that get, we, we get a lot of stuff that kind of seeps into uh, our understanding if we don't have the foundation of what the church teaches. And uh, that can be um, problematic because uh, we don't become angels. Uh, we don't uh, just, we become like an angel in the fact that it's a, it's a separated soul uh, before the end of time and we have the resurrection of the dead. Uh, but we don't become something different than we are. We remain human beings awaiting the resurrection of the body. And so the soul refers to uh, human life or the entire human person. All right. Uh, that innermost aspect, uh, that is which uh, is of most of the greatest value and is created in God's image. It signifies the spiritual principle in us. All right. Uh, and so our body is animated by the spiritual soul. When you think about it, like scientists can't explain why at death, uh, what happens, right? They can't, they can't explain it because the body no longer works. And that's because the soul is the form of the body. It's what makes everything works. It's what gives life uh, to the body. And so when there's a separation of the body and soul, which is what we call death. Uh, that's why our bodies no longer work. That's why there's no person present any longer uh, because of that separation. But there, there's a, there's a definite unity in it. What we do in our body affects our soul uh, and the sins that we commit that are just spiritual sins like pride or envy, for instance, that are connected to the body affect our body as well. Sin makes us sick, as St. Paul says, right? He talks about how some of you are sick because of your sin, right? There's a connection in body and soul that when we're there together in this life, uh, there's an effect between the two because they're a unity. And they were created to be a unity, and death was never part of God's plan, which we'll get to. Uh, the soul is immortal. So God created it at conception. God creates the soul. Uh, immediately and is created immortal and he did this because he desires for us to live forever in communion with him uh, it's the it's our destiny to be in union with God that's why that's what he created us for so uh, that's something very important to remember and so sometimes there's a uh, St. Paul talks about the soul and the spirit uh, at times and there's just a, uh, he's talking about the same thing. All right. So he's talking about the spiritual nature of man. Uh, and it also, you know, can it, sometimes we'll speak of it as the heart, right? Kind of that deepest uh, depths of a person, that central reality to them. Uh, and so that's, uh, that's what the soul is real quickly, just so we understand what we're talking about when we talk about the separation of the soul and the body. Now, as I mentioned a couple times, uh, death is, is a consequence of sin. 
as the catechism tells us. So we'll go back to um, paragraph 108, back in our part there. Uh, so death is a consequence of sin, it says. And even though man's nature is mortal, God has destined him not to die. Death was therefore contrary to the plans of God the Creator and entered the world as a consequence of sin. And we can look at, uh, now get your Bible out, uh, Wisdom, chapter 2. Find your, find wisdom, there it is, wisdom chapter 2 verse uh, 23 says, for God created man for incorruption and made him in the image of his own eternity, but through the devil's envy death entered the world and those who belong to his party experience it. Uh, see, this is an important thing about like really deepening our understanding of Scripture, which the Catechism will help you do because the Catechism has all these references to the Scripture passages that speak to the truths of the faith. Uh, and, that can, and then to go read those and realize this is the Word of God. Like, there's nothing in it that just can be thrown to the side. Like, every bit of it has meaning and depth and speaks truth to us. And so... When you read something like that, it can seem like a passing couple of little lines, uh, but the reality is like that's what we believe, uh, that God made us to live for all eternity, and sin destroyed that. And the first sin was obviously the evil one and his pride and envy, and then he tempted our first parents who then bought into the temptation and distrust entered into their relationship with God, and so death is a consequence of sin it was god did not create it he did not want it uh, but it is uh, the reality because of sin uh, it's contrary to his plans so we would have lived forever had sin not entered into uh, our nature by the fact that the the first our first parents sinned and that's we see right in the beginning if we go to genesis 2 big book of genesis two twenty three and 24 Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, so that was uh, 2, 23, and 24 are obviously before the fall when uh, God created Eve out of, the, out of Adam. And he says, this at last is bone of my bones, the flesh of my flesh. She, she shall be called woman because she was taken out of, of man. Therefore, a man leaves his father and his mother and clings to his wife, and the two become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. See, there's an integrity that was there that's why they were naked without shame because there's an integrity and they didn't as we tend to struggle with today because of sin uh, we didn't see one another as uh, as objects right when they saw the body they saw the person um, and think about that for a moment like there was this kind of intimacy uh, where you could look at the person, uh, at their body, and it made and it showed forth who they were as a person. And now we tend to, with this, with sin enter, entering the world, we tend to objectify others and to look not past their body, not to see the person that lies within. Uh, that is, you know, uh, so to speak, because of the because of sin, and so that's why we look at that and. Uh, he didn't make death because uh, we see in three, 
chapter 3, uh, the temptation. But God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not die, for God knows that when you eat of this, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And so they ate the fruit. And then we uh, see in 3.19, uh, there's this kind of, uh, as God's going through the punishments of sin, right? Because uh, that's sin is a pun. It's, it's a, it has punishments that go along with it, uh, which are just uh, part and parcel with the sin. So we bring it upon ourselves, And so God voices what those are. And the final one, uh, he says, should I get the right one, 19, in the sweat of your face, as he's speaking to the man, in the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Uh, which we're all familiar with from Ash Wednesday. As we receive our ashes, that's one of the lines that people can say. Um, uh, Michelle, uh, uh, just way to bed on that. Uh, Mary did not see the corruption of the grave. She, uh, as we call it uh, for the Holy Ones, fell asleep uh, only because that's what her son did. <laughs> right? Jesus didn't have sin either, but he died for our sake. So she follows uh, her son. Uh, but she did not die because of sin. But in order to be... Um, in order to imitate her son and to show us how to do it as well. Uh, we could do, it'd be a lot bigger, bigger answer, but <laughs> I'll have to get to that maybe later on. Uh, all right, so there's a, also this kind of, uh, there's this idea out there that ev the, it's kind of what you would call the evolutionary view, that death is part of this world, part of life. Um, but let's just look at uh, Wisdom, chapter 1, uh, verses 12 through 15. Uh, and this is what it says. It says, Do not invite death by error of your life, nor bring on destruction by the works of your hands, because God did not make death, and he does not delight in the death of the living. For he created all things that they might exist, and the creatures of the world are wholesome, and there is no destructive poison in them. And the dominion of Hades is not on earth, for righteousness is immortal. But ungodly men, by their words and deeds, summoned death. Considering him a friend, they pined away, and they made a covenant with him, because they are fit to belong to his party. For God created man for incorruption, and made him in the image of his own eternity. But through the devil's envy, death entered the world, and those who belong to his party experience it. So where does death come from? Uh, we see that it comes from sin. Sin leads to death because we are damaging or breaking our relationship with God. Because our spiritual nature, which is the form of our uh, body, right? So it gives life to our body, is meant for union with God. And uh, sin severs that. Uh, relationship and union with God and so we kind of cut ourselves off from the source of life because we're made in the image and likeness of God right and how is that our spiritual nature because uh, God is spirit and so we've we when we sin we cut off from him uh, who is the source of life which is why death entered into the world you can read the catechism on this on uh, paragraph 400 and 402 to 406. I won't go through those, but that's the summation of it. We've cut ourselves off so that when you think about it, the worst punishments of God are when he gives us what we want. Think about it. The worst punishments of God are when he, when he gives us what we want. And we wanted to go our own way in the beginning and we still do today every day we have to battle against that desire to do our own will versus God's will and when we do that in something of serious uh, matter 
it we could cut that relationship off as we talked about mortal sin and venial sin last uh, couple of sessions all right so that's a quick overview let's see if there's any questions and then we'll move on to uh, death in the old and new covenants we'll see anybody else I have to scroll back through these questions real quick nope looks like we're good for for now anyway uh, so let's go to um, what is the revelation of death in the Old Testament so we want to realize that when we're talking about the revelation of God meaning the revealing of who he is in himself uh, there's a progress it's a progressive revelation uh, so throughout the Old Testament uh, the understanding deepens and is purified and it's prepared for the final revelation when God sends his son into the world to reveal his heart and uh, so we're gonna find often a very pessimistic view of death in the Old Testament which is is going to explain why the Sadducees saw no life after death because they only followed the first five books of the Bible called the Pentateuch or the books of book of Moses uh, the Torah uh, and so there that's even though Jesus uh, <laughs> reprimands them and shows that it does speak about life after death in the Torah in those five books when he quotes to them after they try to trip him up uh, we'll, we'll take a look at that but uh, let's just look at a few of the verses from the Old Testament and if you have a handout pulled up or something uh, you'll see these I got them listed there in Psalm 6 verse 5 it says the dead do not praise God right in Psalm 88 in some of the verses it says Sheol in the depths of the pit right so there's a little bit of something but it's never uh, it's never really something to look forward to in the Old Testament and then you go to Ecclesiastes I don't know if you've ever read Ecclesiastes but uh, many people call him the Eeyore of the Old Testament because <laughs> everything's a downer with that guy uh, everything's vanity oh vanities right uh, so he has really the most pessimistic view of death. Uh, let's let's just take a look at it. Um, we read a little bit from it a while ago. This one is in chapter three. Now, the very beginning of chapter three, we often use in uh, funerals. You know, a time for this, a time for that. Uh, but little little later on. We stop before we get to this part. <laughs> um, 16. So judgment and future belong to God is the title they give it. He said, Moreover, I saw under the sun that in the place of justice, even there was wickedness. And in the place of righteousness, even there was wickedness. I said to my heart, God will judge the righteous and the wicked, for he has appointed a time for every matter and for every work. I said in my heart with regard to the sons of men that God is testing them to show them that they are but beasts for the fate of the sons of men and the fate of beasts is the same as one dies so dies the other they all have the same breath and man has no advantage over the beasts for all is vanity all go to one place all from all are from the dust and all turn to dust again who knows whether the spirit of man goes upward and the spirit of the beast goes down to the earth so i saw that there is nothing better than that a man should enjoy his work for that is his lot who can bring him to see what will be after him <laughs> so I mean it's a very pessimistic view of death I mean and they didn't know it, it hadn't been revealed completely uh, by Jesus so we see that there was a couple of exceptions of this pessimism of what happens after death or nothing happens after death in the Old Testament and that was uh, Enoch in Genesis 5 24 uh, who was you know walking with God and then was taken up he just kind of disappears and that's about all you hear about it um, but it's always one of those things where the 
the rabbis and things spoke of it as that. And then again with Elijah in 2 Kings chapter 2, uh, Elijah we know was taken up in a fiery chariot. Uh, so those are kind of two exceptions to that pessimistic rule. There seems to be something with God after death. Uh, and then there's a, there's a few passages that speak to a hope for resurrection. Uh, so this one in the book of Job, Job 19.25. Uh, Job. Great book, Job. Job 19.25 through 27. For I know that my Redeemer lives, and at last he will stand upon the earth. And after my skin has been thus destroyed, then from my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see on my side, and my eyes shall behold and not another. My heart faints within me. So this uh, idea of seeing with his flesh, seeing God with his flesh. Uh, so there's this kind of alluding to and hope of the resurrection. And then on Isaiah... Uh, Isaiah chapter 26, verse 19. We read, your, your dead shall live, their bodies shall rise. O dwellers in the dust, awake and sing for joy. For your dew is a dew of light, and on the land of the shades you will let it fall. Uh, and then in Daniel 12, Daniel 12, uh, verses 1 to 2. At that time shall arise Michael, the great prince who is in charge, who has charge of your people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never has ever never has been since there was a nation till that time but at that time your people shall be delivered every one whose name shall be found written in the book and many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt so we see there in daniel uh we're getting closer to a understanding of uh, a resurrection or hope for a resurrection all right now this is important because Christ has changed everything about what we believe uh, in the resurrection by his death. All right. <clears throat> so we'll go look at uh, paragraph 1009 in the Catechism. It states, death is transformed by Christ. Jesus, the Son of God, also himself suffered the death that is part of the human condition because of sin yet despite his anguish as he faced death he accepted it in an act of complete and free submission to the father's will the obedience of jesus has transformed the curse of death into a blessing all right so think about that for a minute uh, the death of jesus has transformed our death into a blessing do we ever think about it that way we should, as Catholics, as Christians, think about the fact that death is, is a blessing. Think of it this way. Like the toil, the struggle against sin and all the things that go on in this life. And it's the <laughs> aches and pains of the body as you get older. All of these things. Um, like God, it's a mercy that God allowed death as a result of sin because otherwise we'd have to live like this forever right and this broken down stuff but it, uh, what god has done is transformed death by becoming one of us entering into our world taking upon himself our flesh living the life faithfully always in union with god always in obedience with god the father uh, and even going to death for us are the the scariest place for us right it really is the scariest place for us is death that jesus has gone into that uh 
as a warrior and conquer death. Right? Death does not have the last word. Uh, it is not the end because of Jesus. And so we have great hope. And as a matter of fact, he's turn, he turned the curse of death, cursed because of the sin, into a blessing. That's a, that's fairly amazing. And you see that in uh, St. Paul in Philippians. Mm-hmm. All right, Philippians uh, 1, verse 21. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. To me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Uh, it's also right there in uh, quoted in the Catechism and paragraph 1010 uh, where it says because of Christ Christian death has a positive meaning and they quote St. Paul for to, be, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain the saying is sure if we have died with him we will also live with him what is essentially new about Christian death is this through baptism the Christian has already died with Christ sacramentally in order to live a new life and if we die in Christ's grace Physical death completes the dying with Christ, and so completes our incorporation into him in his redeeming act. Uh, so think about this for a minute. Christ speaks of his crucifixion in um, Matthew 10. He speaks of his crucifixion as a baptism. Right? And so when we are baptized, we are baptized into the death of Christ. That's, Paul says that, all over the place uh, Romans 6 3 through 11 Galatians 2 20 Galatians 6 14 and 15 uh, Paul is always talking about the fact that baptism is a baptism into the death of Christ and that we're given this new life and that when we live this new life by God's grace faithfully that physical death is merely the culmination of our baptism so that we can enter fully into the life of Christ to be grafted into that heavenly life of Christ now pretty powerful that's that's a reality of baptism um, <laughs> I'll be quite honest oftentimes as the priest baptizing I don't bring it up a whole lot I talk about it but that's like one of the major points of baptism is that you're you're you've already died with Christ in baptism and to live that new life, physical death at the end of our life, is merely the, the finishing off of baptism, what, what, begun in ba what has begun in baptism, uh, so that we can enter fully into uh, the life of heaven, uh, the life of Christ being part of his body. Uh, it's, it's, it's the completion of our participation in the cross. So this brings up a good point. The fact is uh, we hear a lot of... Um, I've mentioned it a bunch of times. Health and wealth gospel, right? God wants you to be healthy and wealthy. No, God wants you in heaven. All right? The health and wealth gospel is nowhere in these scriptures. Uh, what God says is that he will always be there, that we need not worry about the simple things of life, that God provides those for us. But he does promise us also suffering because sin has broken this world. And he doesn't just fix it with a snap of his fingers, but he invites us into picking up our cross and following Jesus. Uh, and so that eventually is a dying of self. I think it was Saint or a Venerable Fulton Sheen who said, the Christian is not afraid of physical death because each day they hate die with Christ by picking up their cross and following him, by making those little sacrifices each day. So by the time they reach that, they're not afraid because they've died a thousand times, right? You know, just this idea of like recognizing that the, the suffering in this life, we unite with Jesus on his cross and that's our cross. And we uh, are prepared and purified for eternal life. Um, this is the way that Christians have always looked at 
death. And I think most of, for us, most of the time we've been uh, very influenced by the world, uh, by these other worldviews that are uh, virtually, uh, they are incompatible with Christianity. Uh, and so we, we need to know our own worldview. We need to understand what it means for us. And uh, that's part of what, uh, how the New Testament looks at death. It's transformed in Christ. And physical death is just the culmination of our participation in the cross with Christ who died for us and rose from the dead. And so that's our hope, that he will raise us from the dead. Uh, that we die with Christ, we live with him forever. It's important. And you notice in all the saints, by the time they've reached like this kind of union with God, they've been so generous in saying yes to God and being obedient to God and all that he asked for in this life that uh, that they long to die and be with Christ even Paul says this right he, so when he says that for me to live is Christ and to die is gain they always see it the toil of living the gospel of uh, of these things like they want to die and be with Christ so oftentimes at the end of the saints lives you know they're they're uh, people around them those who begin to follow them and you know in order saint francis saint john john of the cross these type of saints you know that everybody's pleading with them to stay not to go and uh, they really desire to be with christ they have no fear of death uh, as a matter of fact there's a few of them quoted here um saint ignatius of antioch said my earthly desire has been crucified there is living water in me water that murmurs and says within me come to the father and he was um, martyred for the faith and desired to be martyred for the faith and then saint Teresa of avila said i want to see god and in order to see him i must die see they get to this point where they just want to see god face to face in the beatific vision and so they're they're happy <laughs> to pass from this life to the next to, to die and enter into eternal life saint Therese of Lisieux said i am not dying i'm entering life right I'm not dying, I'm entering life. Uh, so that's that's where we see the saints. So that's why we desire to be saints. We desire more and more to die with Christ each day to our selfishness and to live with him. Uh, and the more we do that, we're prepared. And death is no longer something to fear, but uh, we see that as that's, that's my birth into eternal life. That's true birth into eternal life. Uh, pretty beautiful. And then uh, in preparing for death, right, we have uh, in, we should prepare for death. There's a, uh, an old practice of the church called memento mori, remember your death, right? So uh, I don't know where I put it. I have a, I have a skull around here somewhere. Um, but it's kind of a reminder. It's not meant to be morbid or anything, but it's a reminder of like, and, and many of the saints would have the skulls on their desk and their pictures and stuff as saints because they just were reminding themselves like that one day will be me and I need to live each day for God because I don't know how many days I have. And so I want to live each day to the fullest for God. And it kind of keeps you focused on what's most important, uh, right? Oftentimes when we get off track, and fall into sin it's because we've uh, lost focus on eternal life and living for God and so we gratify the desires of the flesh and the lowly desires instead of living for, for God so to be pre prepared for our death is a good thing uh, in the ancient lit litany of the saints for instance uh, we pray from a sudden and unforeseen death deliver us O Lord Right. Oftentimes, that's what I hear people want, a sudden and unforeseen death. No, no, no. We want to be prepared for death. So if it's coming, we want to be able to make sure that we're prepared, receive the sacraments. You know, the anointing of the sick used to be called last rites, but don't wait till the last moment, please. There's not enough priests anymore um, to get everywhere uh, that gets called it, and that's you know one of my greatest fears um, and so 
make sure you get anointed whenever you for sick and then uh, I make it to a lot of them but you know sometimes it's uh, it can be it can be difficult and so uh, we want to make sure we're prepared for death so we pray for uh, to be delivered from a sudden and unforeseen death uh, so that we can be prepared and then imagine someone with a devotion to Our Lady who prays the rosary in the Hail Mary, we say, pray for us at, at the uh, hour of our death, right? Pray for us at the hour of our death. And that's a, that's a beautiful thing. So imagine having been devoted to Our Lady, praying the rosary and many Hail Marys throughout, thousands of Hail Marys throughout your life, right? How many times have you prayed to Our Lady to pray for us now and at the hour of our death? She does that when you do that. So... Another reason to pray the rosary, tell you that much. Um, and then St. Joseph, we know, is the ha patron saint of a happy death. So I pray to St. Joseph for a happy death. Uh, also, our chapel's named after St. Joseph, right? I'm always currying favor with the saints. <laughs> Just tease it. In a good way. Like, I pray uh, to St. Joseph, consecrated myself to him, uh, for that very purpose so those are good things prepare yourself for death and then there's a there's this beautiful prayer that i pray when uh i'm called to the bedside of someone who's dying uh, it's called the uh, prayer of commendation and i'll just read it for you it says go forth christian soul from this world in the name of god the father almighty father who created you in the name of jesus christ the son of the living god who suffered for you in the name of the holy spirit who was poured out upon you Go forth, faithful Christian. May you live in peace this day. May your home be with God in Zion, with Mary, the Virgin Mother of God, with Joseph and all the angels and saints. May you return to your Creator who formed you from the dust of the earth. May Holy Mary, the angels and all the saints come to meet you as you go forth from this life. May you see your Redeemer face to face. Beautiful prayer. Um, well, I don't think I can do uh, justice to the particular judgment. Um, so we'll talk about that next time. I'll just give you a little brief um, brief thing on the particular judgment is what happens to us immediately after death. And so we should be <clears throat> prepared for that. Uh, and so we'll look at that next time and we'll probably get into, because that won't take very long, um, and then we'll get into uh, my first page here. There it is. Uh, then we'll take a look at uh, heaven, purgatory, hell, resurrection, and new creation. So there's a lot of good stuff. And you can go ahead and read ahead in the catechism. It kind of follows from those paragraphs we've been looking at. Uh, it moves right through all of these things. I'm just following the catechism and trying to help us uh, to understand these things so we will pull in a lot of uh, scripture as well so we can understand it from that standpoint because that's where we get it from and uh, having your bible and your catechism always good and it's a uh, beautiful teaching because it helps us as we grow in understanding to not be afraid but to prepare to prepare for a good and uh for to for a good death to prepare for and pray for a happy death uh, through the intercession of saint joseph and our lady um, all the saints uh, but that we shall be that doesn't mean we won't suffer that's for sure uh, there's always suffering and suffering is when we're united with jesus on the cross is purifying for us uh, and that's we need to be purified of our attachments to sin uh, of our weaknesses, of our temporal punishment due to sin, like all of these things prepare us. God wants eternal life for us. That's more important than uh, this necessarily easy life. And we see that in the saints too. They teach us how to suffer. Right? The, remember in the Acts of the Apostles when the uh, apostles are kind of whipped for preaching in the name of Jesus and imprisoned and things and they 
glorified God and praised him uh, to have suffered for the name, right? We have to have a better, we have to have a more biblical understanding of suffering, of death, uh, than a other, these other worldviews that we've kind of been um, informed and influenced by uh, in modern culture, uh, because they have no concept or understanding of death. And so it, it makes a difference, because when we know that at the end of my life, I will be judged on what I have done, what I believe and what I've done. And um, then there are two permanent places that I could end up, heaven or hell. Both are very real. Purgatory is an intermediate place of purification before heaven. Uh, and that should form how we live, uh, living for Christ, living the, the death of baptism uh, each day, dying to self to live for him, to being obedient to the will of the Father for us, because that's leads to our happiness. Uh, those type of things are very important, which is why we do this. Let me see if I have a few questions here before we finish up. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Anytime I'm speaking here, I'm never, I'm never saying we should, like they long to be with Christ, so they longed for that death. That doesn't mean we get to choose when that is right that's never something i would ever say that's never something the church teaches so that is a big thing in this world today a euthanasia right that's not a thing that's a sin taking it into our own hands is not our not our not not within our ability uh and not what god wants we're always prepared for it the 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 whole thing is this longing this longing for for god to be with him to be um, brought into that e eternity that's that's a beautiful thing because it purifies us and every one of them would say whatever the Lord wants though we remember st. Paul says this he says but uh, he said I long to die and to be with Christ but if it's better for you and the God wants it for me to toil here then I will do it for as long as he wants right because there's an indifference there they desire and long to be fulfilled and fully with with God in heaven uh, but they do whatever he wants right it's not in our hands we don't we are not the author of life or death uh, God is always the author of life and death so thanks for bringing that up st. Thomas more <laughs> one of you two uh, picture between st. Padre Pio and my family oh That is uh, me holding Luke Wesley Watson. So I baptized him the other day. He's my buddy from uh, high school and his first kid. So um, that's what that picture is. Where do these questions go? All right, there we go. So we need to be purified in purgatory before we can see God face to face or where we see at the moment of death. That depends, Pam, on whether uh, we are free of all sin, attachment to sin, uh, venial sins, all of those things. Whether we're free of all earthly things. You're going to do the suffering here or in purgatory. <laughs> One of the two. So unite all your little sufferings every day to the Lord for purification. Uh, and you can definitely pray to see God immediately, right? To forego purgatory. I think that's what we should do. We should shoot for, uh, always shoot for heaven. Don't shoot for purgatory because if you miss, it's not good. Uh, shoot for heaven. And so offering those little sacrifices, uh, being purified of sin and and those things, all good. And we'll talk about that when we talk about purgatory. Because uh, that's it's important and a good one. We'll get more into that. And praying for a happy death. Uh, how do we discern God's will? If we pray for a happy death, how do we discern God's will? He may not be ready for us. Well, if he's not ready for us, we'll still be here. <laughs> so we don't really need to worry about it. We need to live each day uh, to the fullest for him, the best we can. You know, and there was a, uh, I have to look it up. I forget her name, but there was a saint who 
Uh, she's a saint now. Martha Robin, I think is her name. I don't know if she's a saint. Venerable, maybe. But for 50 years, she was bedridden. And she united all of it with with uh, the Lord. She saved many souls through that. Like, even when we're not able to get out, uh, or we're stuck at home, right, like right now, or we're suffering in some way, like, don't waste any of it. Don't waste your suffering. Unite it with Jesus on the cross and recognize God is purifying you and preparing you for heaven and also is saving souls. There's so many people that have just neglected God. I mean, there's this pernicious view in the world that everybody goes to heaven. So it doesn't matter what you do. <laughs> I've never seen that view in scripture. <laughs> I've never seen Jesus talk about that view. Uh, that is not one. That is a. That is definitely the view of the evil one and what he wants. Do whatever you want. Don't worry about it. Everybody goes to heaven. But I mean, everything Jesus talks about in uh, about heaven is the path is narrow, right? And few make it. That's that's that should motivate us, right? It needs to motivate us to offer every bit of our suffering for our own salvation and for others. Because our prayer and our sacrifices and fasting and things is how God reaches other people. That's what Our Lady of Fatima tells us. It's what she's always asking for, praying for uh, sinners, that they'll repent. So we, uh, uh, I mean, and it's not, it's, it's not to be like tough, but I think we need to, we need to have a, a reality check in what this is really about and not to be uh not to be blinded by this worldly understanding of things um that god commands and demands all of us right there isn't anything better either in this world uh so we need to pray for those that are away so that they can be opened because God desires the salvation of all, right? And he always gives sufficient grace for us to choose heaven. But I'm telling you, don't wait till the last minute. Don't live as if God doesn't exist. Uh, what I call practical atheism, right? People live as if God didn't exist, as if he hadn't said, these things are sins, don't do them. Uh, and sin separates us from God, especially mortal sin. Uh, so that's, so we have to be, we have to have a, a very uh, real, true, biblical worldview uh, in order to navigate this life. Uh, that doesn't mean that we ever despair uh, of our own sinfulness or stuff, because we always trust in God's mercy. His mercy is always there. The ones that we worry about are the ones that don't even care. They don't they don't even ask God for mercy, right? That's the sin against the Holy Spirit, not recognizing that you need forgiveness from God because of your sin. So we have to be uh, very careful. We have to allow God to mold us in the biblical worldview so that we can help others. Just be quite honest with you. And I, I, I don't know, like there's... Uh, just to share a little bit quickly here of my own heart, own priestly heart, uh, that God shares some of these things with his priests in this desire. I've said this before. Like, I'd love to be the guy that gets up there on Sunday and just tells you cute little stories in the homily. <laughs> right? And everybody likes, everybody wants to have over for the, for the barbecue. But what's that good? What good is that for you, right? You need to hear the gospel to have it opened up for you, um, and to allow God to penetrate your heart through the gospel. And that usually means that we need continual conversion and repentance. But on the one hand, we have that. On the other hand, God is infinitely merciful and he desires to pour out his mercy upon us. 
Uh, he desires, as Paul tells us in one of his letters, he desires that all men be saved. But the reality is, as I said before, the worst punishment of God is that he gives us what we want. And if we don't want him, then he, he won't force us. And so we have to kind of help people see that to want God is the greatest joy of your life and to seek him, even when it's hard, even when it's difficult and struggle and suffer. Suffering is going to come no matter what. Uh, but to unite it with Christ, to see that he's already done it for us, that's powerful. That's what changes us. So we always know of God's mercy. And we pray that others, we pray for them to experience God's mercy, to turn to it. Uh, but also we're not meant to be wishy-washy when it comes to what God has called sin that separates us from him. Uh, and so I, I won't ever be, <laughs> because I, I don't care if people like me or not, right? There were plenty of people who didn't like Jesus when he preached the truth to them. And his truth is hard. I mean, sometimes I read it, I'm like, well, that's hard, right? But that's what we're called to. Uh, we're called to preach that fullness of those two things, that yes, we're sinners, we got to recognize that. But God's mercy is always here. And look what he's done for you. Look at this love. Turn yourself over to the love of God. And then you don't have to worry about it as much, right? Because that, that love of God transforms us. Uh, and he loves us now, even in our brokenness, even in those who are so far away from him, seem so far away from him. He loves them and he's always reaching out to them in little ways. But at some point they have to make the decision to follow him. They have to make the decision to repent uh, of that. And we need to support them with our prayers, offering our sufferings and penances to the Lord for sinners. Uh, and because I think that's that's the important part. That's the, the necessity, the urgency that is on my heart. Uh, because oftentimes we think, well, I don't want to, I don't want to bother anybody or upset them, uh, you know, but sometimes we have to ask the Lord to inspire us to say something to someone be like, Hey, take another look at this, like pray about this, enter into this, uh, believe, right? It will change your life. And, uh, sometimes we'll be rejected for it. Um, uh, but more times we need to trust in God's grace at work in their lives uh, and pray for them that someone else will be sent into their life. Maybe if you're a family member, it's harder. Pray that God sends somebody else in their life to move them back to him. Uh, but that's very important. That's why we study these things because it's helpful for us to know. Uh, Oh, good. Yeah, you're welcome, Dan. Um, 3 p.m. is the hour of mercy. <laughs> and uh, That's a beautiful thing that you receive those sacraments and strength in that. Uh, I just want to thank all of you for joining me tonight. And we'll have uh, we'll have another one next week. And uh, next week we'll look at the particular judgment and then get into heaven. All right, so we will be good. Good to take a look at heaven first before we have to look at the other things that are realities. Uh, but these, these things far from, it shouldn't make us cower or any of that. This is what the Christian life is about, right? Uh, so it should help us to live this life. Well, that's what's most important. Live this life. Well, even if you're struggling with sin, right? You're struggling with serious sin. Don't ever give up. You keep praying. You dig into your prayer life. You go to confession. You know, whatever these things are, like you, you keep striving uh, with the Lord because that's what he wants. He wants that for you. But also, don't be afraid to uh, do all that you need to to get away from sin. Right? If you're, as Jesus says, if your right arm causes you to sin, then cut it off. Uh, don't literally cut your arm off. But. What is the thing that causes, what, what is the thing that leads to sin sometimes? Maybe it's our phone or computer or something. Change how you use it. Uh, do something to get away from sin. Uh, don't maim yourself. But Jesus was using hyperbole there to show us like, that's how serious sin is. So let's do all that we can to get away from it and to grow in holiness and to trust in God's grace and mercy. So let's finish there. <laughs> I'll, be, I'll be quiet now. 
Uh, and let's pray. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Uh, greatest thing we could pray right now after that talk is a Hail Mary. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Uh, Saint Joseph, patron of a happy death, pray for us. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless you all. We'll see you next week. Thanks.